are we just are we poisoning ourselves? Are we like collectively as a society mindlessly poisoning ourselves with processed food, with sugar, with carbohydrates? Because it kind of seems like that's what's going on. It kind of seems like one of the primary catalysts or primary contributors to this mental health crisis that we have going on, it really seems like you're showing some compelling evidence that a huge part of it is because we are essentially poisoning ourselves with processed sugary food. I actually do believe that we are poisoning the human species. Food is the obvious unequivocal culprit Obesity rates are skyrocketing around the globe. Type 2 diabetes and prediabetes is skyrocketing around the globe. And mental disorders, which I consider metabolic disorders of the brain, are also skyrocketing around the globe. So anybody who says I'm being alarmist, <laughs> um, you just have to look at the statistics and ask a basic common sense question. What the hell's going on? Welcome back to the transmission, my friends. And as you may know, there are a few things that fascinate me and motivate me more than the mind and mental health and well-being in general, because if we don't have those things, we really don't have anything. So I'm always on the lookout for developments in this topic and especially novel approaches to this topic, novel approaches to improving our mental health and our mental performance. So when I came across the work of Dr. Chris Palmer, I knew immediately after even doing a cursory deep dive that I needed to have this man in the mind meld. Dr. Palmer's thesis is nuanced, it's technical, so it's a bit intimidating to try to nutshell it briefly, but I'm gonna do it anyway, hopefully while committing minimal violence to his work. It's essentially this, that our mental health, our metabolic health, and even our cellular health are not separate. They are intimately interwoven. And that we actually have a modicum of power, some agency over all of the above. And we can influence it a lot more than the traditional medical and psychological establishment would have us believe. Much of Chris Palmer's work revolves around the surprising power of diet, but there are several other highly important vectors that we talk about in this mind meld as well in great detail. And on that note, Dr. Chris Palmer is a psychiatrist and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. He's the author of Brain Energy, A Revolutionary Breakthrough in Understanding Mental Health and Improving Treatment for Anxiety, Depression, OCD, PTSD, and more. We get into so much in this mind melt. Dr. Chris Palmer's own experience dealing with mental health issues uh, and physical health challenges. We also talk a lot about the importance of questioning dogma and the establishment and the quote unquote experts, uh, especially when it comes to your own health and your own mental well-being. We also get into a variety of specific behavioral, environmental, and dietary interventions for mental and really overall health and so much more. I am so pleased with how much actionable, practical juice there is in this mind melt. So let's get into it. All the links you're gonna need for Dr. Chris Palmer and his book are in the description. And speaking of work, if you appreciate this work and this content, the greatest thing you can do is tickle the algorithm here on YouTube with a like and a sub. And actually do drop Third Eye Drops a sub wherever you listen to podcasts as well, because we've got over 300 audio only episodes with a myriad of brilliant beings available wherever you listen, Spotify, Apple Pods, everywhere you find podcasts. I would also love to have you in our Wonder Lodge over at Patreon. Uh, via Patreon, of course, you can crowd sponsor the show, but you also get rewards like stickers, pins, shirts, and more. We have a book club. We have monthly Wonder Gym hangs featuring myself and a guest you've heard on the show and much more. And with that, my friends, let's meld minds with the brilliant Dr. Chris Palmer. Dr. Chris Palmer, there are so many angles to approach this conversation from so excited to tap into your expertise, your story, uh, your wisdom, because it it really spans kind kind of a lot of different disciplines. I feel like, and I think you're you're offering something really unique and medicinal. 
So uh, I, I've really been looking forward to this. Thanks. Th- I, it's, it is a pleasure to be here with you. So like I said, there are a myriad of ways to approach this conversation from, but the one that always resonates with me is story. And I was struck by a story that I heard you tell on another podcast, uh, the Huberman podcast. I might as well just say it. Everybody should go listen to it uh, because I can safely say there's going to be a lot of neuroscientific bits that you can extract from from that conversation that we probably won't go over as technically in this one. But the story of your own battles to gain insight into what has now become what you're really known for. And and that story really resonated with me for a few reasons. One, it's just a, a beautiful story of transmuting something difficult into something beneficial, not only for you, but for everybody. And also there's this beautiful mythological overlap. Have you ever heard of the sort of Jung referred to this as the myth of the wounded healer? I vaguely am familiar with that, but yeah. That that your story really reminded me of that, my friend, because there's 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 a few different primary uh mythological examples of this. Probably the most well known is the Greek myth of uh Chiron or Chiron. We don't have to get all into that. But um but it's essentially just this archetype of taking either a core wound or a core struggle and somehow transmuting that into something beneficial or medicinal. And I feel like you're just a like a walking example of this in many ways. I, I guess I am. You're putting it in all these heroic terms. <laughs> I'm, I, I kind of, the way I experience it and think about it is I kind of feel like I went through hell and I somehow escaped. And so I want to help other people escape that same hell. I mean, I mean that's one of the most noble ambitions I can imagine. And I think it's something that a lot of people strive for. Um, and in in doing some quick Googling on that earlier today, I found a really interesting statistic that I could not substantiate. But the statistic was that it's, I think it was 82% of people in psychology graduate programs admit that they're there because they want to work on some core issue with themselves or that they're in this field because there's something within that they're trying to work on at the same time as, you know, clearly going into a line of work that is to to help others do the same. So there there's something there's something to this. There's something I, I think beautiful and and very relevant a, a, about that. It's interesting because <clears throat> you know I have I have my own personal story with mental illness and um, really horrible struggles with suicidality and all sorts of stuff. But the real reason I'm a psychiatrist is because of what my mother went through. Hmm. And I was basically just really pissed off at the mental health field. I just saw them as a bunch of incompetent, arrogant people who couldn't help her when she desperately needed help. I saw what was happening to her. I knew there was something wrong with her. I wasn't in denial about mental illness. I knew that there was something wrong with the way she was thinking. She was suicidal, depressed, psychotic. There was clearly something wrong. And initially I was kind of in disbelief. Like, why aren't these doctors helping her? Like what's wrong with them? Why they don't like they 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 have to see what's wrong with her, and they're giving her these drugs that are basically drugging her, but not helping her. They're just making her look sedated and and drugged. And she said she felt drugged and she looked drugged, but she was still crazy and still depressed and still suicidal. And I'm like, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> like, is yeah. this what we've got? And and then when I went through my own experiences, I had I had some horrible experiences with the mental health profession. And at the end of the day, I ended up becoming a psychiatrist mostly because I was just really disgusted with the mental health field. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh and 
and recognize that these are real disorders that can ruin people's lives. And somebody should do something about that. Some, like somebody needs to figure this out. Somebody needs to do better than, than what these people who treated my mother were able to do. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole other angle to, to try to transmute a wound. I mean, you've got multiple layers of, of things to work through. But I do think that the way that you went about approaching that is probably, you know, the best way one can. I mean, trying to change a system from the inside out that they feel like a victim of or that they feel like a loved one was a, a victim of, sadly, when they were going there to seek help. So I guess just to unleash a, a very simple easy to answer question on you. Where did that go wrong? Where did the psychiatric field go wrong? Is it just because everything becomes so normalized and people start resting on laurels and going through the motions and they become disconnected from the reality of the suffering that they're confronted with every day? Or I, I mean, I know philosophically you think it goes much deeper and technically it goes much deeper than just that. But where to, to just I would love to hear your riff on where you think it went astray and why and how rather you've changed you've begun to try to change this in your own practice. And obviously you're starting to, I would say, influence the field at large. Well, I hope so. <laughs> but uh um I'm certainly trying my best. I you know, I think to answer your question, I wanna I want to recognize what the mental health field sometimes gets right. Yeah. And and I think this is part of it at the heart of what what I'm going to end up saying is wrong with the mental health field. So first of all, we have to be able to define what is a mental illness or what is a mental health problem. And right now, we really don't have clarity on that issue. And most people don't have clarity on that issue. And I think that is in part what contributes to the stigma of mental illness. And so I'll give you three kind of fairly straightforward ways to think about mental illness. So the first one is that everybody has normal human emotions. And those normal human emotions include depression and anxiety. If you get dumped by the love of your life, you're going to get depressed. That is normal. I don't consider that a brain disorder. Right. I don't consider that a chemical imbalance. I consider that being a normal human being going through normal suffering. Now, does that human being deserve compassion? Yes, of course. Might that human being need help to cope with what he or she's going through? Yes, of course. Might that help come in the form of a psychotherapist? Sure, why not? Um, nothing wrong with that, but I am very reluctant to call that a brain disorder. And yet DSM would tell us that if the symptoms last for more than two months, or two weeks, actually, that it's a brain disorder called major depressive disorder. So if you get dumped for the by the love of your life, or if your wife and kids tragically get killed in an automobile accident, yeah. you have 13 days, count them, 13 days to get over it. And if you haven't gotten over it in 13 days, you've got a brain disorder. That is ridiculous. Yeah. There's another category of extreme psychological trauma, stress, life-threatening situations. Soldiers on a battlefield, a woman being beaten up repetitively by her husband, a kid on the playground being relentlessly bullied and teased. Those people are all experiencing extreme adversity. And they will develop symptoms of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic symptoms, and other symptoms. I don't consider those brain disorders either. I consider those human beings going through extreme situations of stress and trauma and having normal adaptive reactions 
Do they need help? Yes, they need help. They need compassion, all of that stuff. But the ideal treatment in those situations is to get them out of those harmful, dangerous situations. Yeah. I don't consider those brain disorders. But then there is a category that I do unequivocally consider a brain disorder. And my mother had one. She began having delusions. She began to believe things that were wild and crazy. She had never believed them before. They didn't make sense. They didn't add up. She was behaving in erratic ways. She was doing other things. That's a brain disorder. When somebody is starting to have panic attacks for no reason whatsoever, they're minding their own business, They've got, a, they've got a calm, relaxed day. They're sitting in the comfort of their home, and out of the blue, they get overwhelmed with anxiety and panic. That is a disorder. The brain is doing something it should not be doing. It doesn't make sense anymore. It's not. It, the way I think about it is the brain is malfunctioning. When somebody has chronic, unrelenting depression for no clear reason whatsoever, it's not that they got dumped by the love of their life three weeks ago. It's They, they will say, I don't know why I am so miserable. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why I am obsessed with dying and suicide. I can't figure it out. On paper, I have a good life. When I think about it objectively, I have a good life, yet I am consumed with misery and despair and depression, and I don't know what's wrong with me. I think those people have brain disorders. I think their brains are doing things that they should not be doing. They're no longer appropriate. And the treatment for that is to help those people's brains function normally. So I think... One of the things that the mental health field does right, at least some of the times, is in the first two categories. The people who have normal stress and reactions, or even the people, you know, the soldiers on a battlefield, sometimes we deliver treatment, psychotherapeutic treatments, or cognitive behavioral treatments, or other things, or even sometimes the pills that we give can help those people cope and deal with horrible stressors, adversity, and we can help them manage that and come out the other side okay. The brain disorder thing gets much more complicated. As soon as we say it's a brain disorder right now and for centuries now, our field says we have no idea what's going on. We know there's a problem. We see there's a problem. We have all this research on brain scans and genetics and hormones and neurotransmitters, but nobody to date has been able to put it all together. And all of the treatments that we have for those brain disorders were all discovered through serendipity, hmm. meaning the first antidepressant was actually a tuberculosis treatment that just happened to make people less depressed. The first antipsychotic was actually an anesthetic medication. And they just noticed, wow, this makes people docile or tranquil, and maybe we'll give that to those psychotic people to calm them down. All of the treatments that we have still to this day, people are scratching their heads trying to figure out if they do work for people, we really kind of don't know why they work. You know, we, we talk about chemical imbalances, but any good neuroscientist or psychiatrist knows that's a farce. <laughs> that is a scientific farce. It has been proven incorrect. For any of you who don't know this, it is not truth. Not based on science, not based on neuroimaging studies, not based on genetic studies, not based on autopsy studies or any of the other studies we've done. People do not have chemical imbalances in their brains. And yet we prescribe these meds because they can reduce symptoms. And so, but when you look at the outcome data for all of those people, when you look at the outcomes for people who have chronic mental disorders, the outcomes are abysmal. Yeah. 
unfortunately. And, yeah. and it's not that the treatments can't work. It's not that they don't work some of the time. Some of the time they do. But for anybody who thinks I'm being way too pessimistic and kind of like, Chris Palmer, you're just a bitter, jaded person. And, and, and you should be more positive about the mental health field and the treatments that we've got. For anybody who thinks that, I just want to point out, mental disorders are now the leading cause of disease burden and disability on the planet yeah. throughout the entire world. And the majority of people getting disability for mental illness are getting treatment. It's not that they're not getting treatment. It's that our treatments are failing to work. Right. And so our field is in crisis. The world is in crisis and we need new ideas and new solutions. Well, you, that whole beautiful, it was like a perfect introduction to, to everything I want to talk to you about in this mind meld today. And of course, one of the major headings in my notes is just the ongoing mental health crisis. And you know all the statistics better than I do. But for me, the most compelling ones are around suicide uh, and young men, because young men in particular are taking their lives at an alarming rate. In some countries, it's the leading cause of death. In some countries, it's the like the second leading cause of death in men under the age of 50. And one, one statistic, you know, statistics are easy to just sort of get numb to. But one statistic I read that is just horrific is that only one in every 20 suicides is successful. So if you think about, like, you see this number associated with suicides, for every single person that's successful, like, another 20 people tried. Like, another 20 people were in just as dark of a place. So, I mean, that just really, you know, the, the weight of 800,000 people committing suicide is already impossible to process. But then you have to multiply it by 20 to truly understand, like, the depths of just horror that some people are are living in. And... As you've pointed out, the reasons that contribute to people getting to these dark places are so difficult to understand, so difficult to under, you know, like, know where to even begin how to approach the question. Because as you point out, some people are in acute distress over something that happened in their life. Some people are having, you know, developmental depression. You know, I like... I like to I kind of like to romanticize mental illness sometimes because I I do think in some cases it's a rite of passage it's a, it's a, it's your something deep in you calling out for something more in your life to to do something that matters like I just had a, a conversation with Dr. Lisa Miller from uh, Columbia all about this and I think that that's very real and I think a lot of people especially in my age group are experiencing something akin to that but as you point out, beyond the shadow of a doubt, there's way more to it than that. They're like you can give people all the meaning in the world and that's not going to fix what's physiologically and neurologically going on under the hood with some people. But then again, as you point out, it's so difficult to know how to approach that because it's not like I cut myself, fix this, or this organ is dysfunctioning, you know, and we can see it in a scan, fix this. It's something way more esoteric and way more multifaceted and, and endemic. Like, I mean, as you point out in the book, that really is going all the way down to like the cellular mitochondrial level in a lot of cases. So maybe this is a good time to make it a little, you know, a little more tactile to loop back into your own story and how you slowly were able to approach this from a from what most people would consider to be a pretty novel angle in in your field. Yeah, so I you know my own personal story is that I you know I had symptoms of mental illness starting at a really young age. I developed OCD um you know probably at least by first or second grade. It was never diagnosed. Nobody ever knew about it. Nobody, um, I never got treatment for it as a kid. Um, I think people who saw kind of the symptoms of OCD in me just thought I was a weird kid. Um, so I, so I just went through life as a weird kid and, uh, um, 
Uh, but I would, you know, I became convinced that the air was contaminated at one point in time oh, wow. for like at least a year or so. And so I would put my hand over my mouth every time I talked. And people would like ask, like, what's wrong? Why are you doing that? And I'm, uh, I would make stuff up because I knew it sounded crazy to say, like, I can't say the air is contaminated because that sounds crazy. And I know it sounds crazy, but that's what I'm really thinking. And um, so I had all sorts of symptoms of OCD. Um, and then, and then when I was about twelve or thirteen, um, that is when my mother had her psychotic break. And uh, um, uh, I have seven brothers and sisters. Uh, her psychotic break was horrific um, for our family. It, it ended up resulting in divorce. Um, and uh, so my mother actually kind of lost everything in the divorce. She lost custody of all eight of her kids. Wow. She lost all of the money. She had worked her ass off to help start this business with my father, a pharmacy. She lost that. She got poverty level support. Um, and she's depressed, psychotic, and suicidal. And so... I, you know, I never got along with my father. And so that was part of the decision. But the biggest part was I knew she was going to die. Um, like, and I saw what was happening to her. She had already been hospitalized psychiatrically. She was seeing all of these psychiatrists and therapists and other people. She was actually seeing a priest for counseling. And I have reason to think that he probably did something sexual to her. Oh my God. Um, and that probably, that may have been one of the things that helped push her over the edge. Um, you know, that particular priest was, you know, kicked out of the Catholic church for sexual abuse. He was wow. kicked out of a subsequent church for sexual abuse. And um, years, years later, he kind of told me, he was like bragging for, for, I don't know why he was confessing this to me. I don't think he saw it as a confession, but he was going on about how he, you know, how he had a right to have sex with people that he cared about. And uh, and I'm thinking, wow. did you have sex with my mom? Like, is that is that what fucking did this to her? <laughs> like, you, I, oh, I, 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 man. I, I, I was ready to attack him, but uh, anyway. So she's she's doing all that. So I went to live with her. I left my father's home. I went to live with her. We end up homeless together for a little while. Um, we subsequently get a tiny little apartment. That was just a horrific time in my life. Um, I became severely depressed. Um, I wasn't suicidal yet at that point. But then going through high school, I was horribly depressed, chronically suicidal. Um, I ended up leaving. Uh, my mom made me go back and live with my dad uh, after about a year. And then I left my father's home before I finished high school. Oh, wow. so, uh, so I was kind of on my own. So chronically depressed, suicidal, no college plans, no nothing. <laughs> you know, I was... I was getting, I got treatment through that. I, I was hospitalized. I was put on all sorts of psychiatric medications, um, getting psychotherapy. It was all worthless. Um, it was actually probably harmful in retrospect. Can, can, um, I, can I ask you a question about that? Do you, yeah. Do you have misgivings about psychotherapy in general because of what you went through? Or do you think that this is just shortcomings on these particular therapists part? Or what are your thoughts on that? I think there are phenomenal therapists who do life-saving work and tremendously help people. I do psychotherapy with patients. Um Sometimes I think I'm okay, <laughs> maybe even good. Um, maybe I'm deluding myself. 
but uh, so I, I think in that case, it a lot of it was largely based on their paradigm. And, mm. you know, if they were psychoanalytically oriented, they were analyzing my relationship with my mother and my father, thinking about edible complexes and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. When in the context of everything I've just told you, they I don't think they even asked me about the trauma that I went through of being homeless or any they didn't they didn't give a shit about that. They were interested in what do you think of your mother's and your father's genitalia kind of stuff. And Jeez. you know, that is just asinine. It is just asinine. The reality is there are still therapists today who will do that. They will just ignore trauma. They will ignore common sense, obvious, <laughs> obvious causes of suffering in the people in front of them and focus instead on their little kind of sick interests. Um, but it can go every way. There are some therapists who are focused on everybody's had trauma Every human being on the planet has had trauma, and that is the cause of all mental illness. I don't believe that for one second. Hmm. And it is true that most people have had trauma, but I get that from population surveys. About 80% of human beings have been traumatized in their lives at some point. And so, but but the majority of those people come out okay. Yeah. And and, you know, 80% of people, probably more than this, get the cold virus as well. That doesn't mean the cold virus causes all mental illness. So just because something occurs doesn't mean it is the root cause in everyone. The majority of people who get traumatized come out the other side okay. But some don't. And we need to distinguish that. We need to be a little more savvy. I don't I'm I know this probably sounds really complicated to people. I'm not talking about complicated. I'm talking about common sense. I grew up in the Midwest. I'm talking about common sense, folks. I'm talking about just ask the person. <laughs> ask the person, why are you so depressed? Listen to what they tell you and does that even make sense? And if it makes sense, then help them resolve that conflict. If they say I'm so depressed, Going back to the example you gave with young men sometimes. If they say the reason they're so depressed is because they start talking about the existential crisis they're in, yeah. or I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to find anybody to love me. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know what I'm going to do for a living. I feel lost. I'm confused. Um, uh, I game all the time and uh, numb my feelings. Um, all the time with substances. Why are you attacking well, me, Chris? That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm giving you some love. The the answers are obvious, and the answers aren't you have a chemical imbalance of serotonin in your brain and you need a serotonergic medication. The answers aren't we need to talk about your mother and how you felt about her sexually. Um, the answers are helping you find your way in life, yeah. mm -hmm. helping you figure out, well, who are you really? What are you interested in? What are you yeah. passionate about? How can we turn that into a life, yeah. a life that you can be passionate about that you want to pursue? Um, and so helping those people find their way, those are common struggles, I don't consider those brain disorders. They are common struggles of human suffering, though. You read, you can read mythology, you can read the great literature from hundreds or thousands of years ago, and those are common themes. That, yes. is, that is part of just being a human being. 100%. Is trying to figure out who are we, where do we belong, how do we fit in, how do we manage conflicts, and and the answers again, 
the answers aren't always easy. They're not always simple. But there are solutions available, and they're common sense solutions, and they usually don't involve pills. Um, but but we do need to recognize that there are people who develop brain disorders. Yeah, and so we need to be clear in our minds about those things. Um, so yeah, so so for you, you know, you're going through so many, I mean, just, just a nightmare of issues with your, your mother, you're slowly kind of coming to terms with your, your own mental health struggles. And, and I think as kids, so many of us look back on the way we were, you know, to, to get into a topic that will run through this conversation. We know what our diets were. We know what our habits were. And I personally feel like it's a miracle that I turned out halfway normal. You know, I was like, I was mostly raised by an amazing single father, but that meant like microwavable food that meant like highly processed food all the time. And then I look at myself in grade school as like, you know, exhibiting what I now I'm like, that was, I was a hundred percent at ADD back then. And I still do to an extent, but you know, we look back on those times now it's like, well, well, no, no wonder, no wonder. I mean, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of guidance. I didn't have proper nutrition. My my brain certainly didn't have the fuel that it needed to function optimally and focus. So there there's so much going on, but for you, you know, your your crisis began to as I understand it deepen in different ways and manifest in different ways where um you know, I'll let you connect the dots for people in terms of the narrative of your own life and how you you pulled yourself out of you know, the situation you were in, but this persisted later on into your life through, through medical school in different ways. Yeah. So, um, so I kind of left off the story with, I'm just kind of a, a hopeless mess in, in high school, <laughs> yeah. um, had no college plans, uh, end up moving in with two of my sisters, um, who were going to Purdue and, uh, just, they offered to, you know, they, they came to my graduation and said, why don't you move in with us? It'll be cheaper. Um, and so I moved in with them, worked two jobs, donated plasma twice a week. Um, I, it was, I was like working my butt off. So, um, ended up, they, they kept pushing me to go to college. I ended up going to college, making the decision that if I'm going to, if I'm going to work so hard to right. save up money for tuition and stuff. I'm going to do well. So I ended up doing really well in college. College ended up being a huge turning point for me. I started college still very depressed, still very suicidal, um, uh, and ended in a great place. I had done extraordinarily well, had a, a new set of friends, um, uh, Things were going much better. I end up getting into pretty competitive medical school, did phenomenally well in medical school, um, actually won an award for being one of the top students, and then end up in a Harvard psychiatry residency. And um, and at that point, I'm so I'm still in medical school and residency, I kind of went back to the mental health field. Because I'm learning about, you know, chemical imbalances and all the medications yeah. and all the treatments that we have to offer. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe I need to give psychiatry a better, another chance. Like, and I'm thinking about becoming a psychiatrist. Maybe I need to give this a shot, another shot. Maybe the people that I got in, you know, earlier in life were just awful clinicians. I went through a few of them, but uh And so I'm trying Prozac and different medicines and none of it's really working all that great. It kind of sort of changed or reduced some of the symptoms, but more often than not gave me more side effects. So I wasn't sleeping now. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having akathisia and restlessness. Um, kind of like I've had way too much coffee. Hmm. I'm having other side effects of these medicines. Um, and the doctor is wanting to put me on even more medicine to deal with all those side effects. And I'm really thinking, right. I, I don't know how I feel about all these meds. This does not seem like a great idea. 
and uh, end up being diagnosed with metabolic syndrome, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, like really high LDL cholesterol, sky high triglycerides, really low HDL cholesterol, and prediabetes. My blood sugars are bad. So year after year, I'm going to the doctor. He keeps telling me, low-fat diet and exercise. I'm doing a low-fat diet. I'm exercising. None of it's working. He finally gets to a point where he's like, you know, for one or two years, is pushing me on meds. Like, you got to take medicines for all this stuff. Um, And I'm resisting. I'm thinking, why do I, like, I'm a disciplined person. I am doing what you're telling me to do. I am on this low-fat diet of yours, and I am exercising regularly. This is not fair. I deserve a chance to, like, not have to take blood pressure medicine and diabetes medicine when I'm in my 20s. This is ridiculous. Um, And, but he kept, he keeps pushing me. I finally break down and in a last ditch effort, because he was really pushing hard now and my blood pressure was really getting ridiculously high. And in a last ditch effort, I decided I'm going to do this Atkins diet thing um, to see if it might help. Yeah. Um, And, and why, like, I know that that was, you know, hot at that time, probably, but I'm sure there were more sophisticated reasons you had for thinking there might be something to this. So, so where really you, you're just like, I'll just no. try it. Okay. No, no. Basically I had had about, I think two different people completely unrelated to each other told me, oh, I know somebody who went on that Atkins diet and it made their diabetes better or it made their blood pressure better. Mm-hmm. And when I first heard that, I was incredulous. Right. I, I actually was. I was like, that's impossible. Eating eggs and bacon in the morning, and that's really bad for your cholesterol. That is the that is a medical fact. We know that. Eggs are horrible for you. Everybody knows it. All of my medical school doctor teachers and stuff were telling me that. Eggs, back then... There was zero doubt in the experts' minds. Let me be clear. There was zero doubt, no ambiguity whatsoever. Eggs were a human toxin. Wow. Zero doubt. Eggs, human toxin. All sources of fat are human toxins. That includes nuts. That includes olive oil. That includes avocados. In the 1990s, all of those were considered human toxic food, and the experts were 100% certain that they were right about that. Wow. I say that because I really want you to take with a grain of salt anybody who says they're a nutrition expert, anybody who says we have data on this, we know what the science says. I want you to question them because most of the time they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And a lot of what they're spewing even today will be proven wrong years later. So we now know that everything that I just told you, eggs are a toxic food. No, actually, eggs are really good for you. Olive oil is a toxic uh, human toxin. Well, no, actually, olive oil is part of a Mediterranean diet. We changed our mind about that. Um, no, the olive oil is good for you. Nuts are toxins because they're so high in fat. No, oh, nuts are good for you now. Avocados are good for you, on and on. So that was the Atkins diet. And it was largely, you know, the medical establishment basically said, if you go on the Atkins diet, you're going to have a heart attack within two years. (laughs) That was kind of, that was, but that's what I signed up for because I had been trying the medical dogma for a, for for years now. Yeah. And you're probably and excited about the idea that it might work and prove them all wrong at this point. <laughs> I was like I, I I talked to two people who said it really did miraculous stuff for them, so I'm out of options. I really don't want to have to go on three medicines out of the, you know, for my metabolic syndrome already. So, I'm going to give this thing a try. I give the Atkins diet a try and within 3 months everything is better. My my metabolic syndrome is completely gone. Yeah. Blood pressure is normal. Lipids are normal. 
I'm no longer pre-diabetic. But the thing that was dumbfounding to me was that my mental health was dramatically improved in a way that I truly thought was impossible for me. Wow. All right. Technical difficulties. I think we'll be able to do a pretty seamless stitch there. But just in, in case there's a, a strange hiccup, people people know. So anyway, yeah, metabolic syndrome. So like mo- most people, I don't think know just how insidious that would be to deal with. Fe- feeling like no matter what you do, no matter how much you're exercising, supposedly no matter how good your diet is, you just can't. There's something wrong with your metabolism. It's just almost like sabotaging you. Um, so so you were going through that. Yeah. And, and basically the, the doctor kind of leaned in at one point and actually asked me is, you know, do your parents have diabetes? Yep. Check. Do your parents have high blood pressure? Check. Do your parent, are your parents overweight? Check. Um, and so he says, well, it's genetic. That's what it is. It's genetic. You're just going to have to bite the bullet and go on medications. and. I was, you know, although I had learned that in medical school, I was not happy about accepting that as my final answer because I recognized that if I am on three different medicines for blood pressure and diabetes and cholesterol when I'm in my 20s, that I'm probably going to be having heart attacks in my 50s. Um. And so I was determined to see if I could figure out how to control this on my own. But the medical establishment was no longer giving me information that I could use. Um, They were really pushing me on pills. And although this may sound kind of like you know, this seems rare or something. If any of any of you who who are unfamiliar with this kind of problem, this is ubiquitous in the United States. Over ninety percent of human beings in the United States, um, or at least adults in the United States, have at least one of the symptoms of metabolic syndrome, mm. wow. meaning they have high blood pressure or bad cholesterol or lipids or prediabetes or abdominal obesity. They have something. Um, and, you know, diabetes and prediabetes currently affects about 40 to 50 percent of the United States adults. Um, you all know obesity rates are skyrocketing. I wasn't even obese. I wasn't even technically overweight when I had all of that. But basically, all of that means that you, the metabolism in your body, and now I am arguing in the brain, is not functioning properly. When you have those kinds of symptoms, your, there's something wrong with your metabolism, and that can create all sorts of problems in your body and brain. So you change your diet. Huge overhaul, I'm guessing. How were you making sense of such a dramatic shift in your own body? Were you just, were you formulating the beginnings of your hypothesis at this time? Or were you just sort of mystified by by what was going on? Well, so I had read the Dr. Atkins book, and he really pushed hard on insulin, that it's all about insulin resistance and high insulin levels, and that carbohydrates were the cause of that. Um, So that if you get rid of carbohydrates or reduce your carbohydrates dramatically, you can can be healthier. And so I had no reason to dive deeper than that at that point in time. Um, And I just assumed, well, seems like he's right because this this recipe for a diet, a nutrition plan that he has given worked miracles for me. So I just assumed it was all about carbohydrates are bad. They cause a spike in insulin and and that is wreaking havoc on the body somehow or another. 
Um, how that fit into mental health, I had no idea. I didn't really think too much about it. Um, I just, I, I didn't even, initially I wasn't even sure, you know, early on, I just thought this is a really weird thing. Maybe, you know, and I kind of wondered whether it would even happen in other people. Pretty quickly, friends and family were doing the diet and I was noticing similar changes in them. So I started to recognize, wow, this, this is a thing. This, it's not just me. It's other people too. Within a couple of years, I start using it in patients with treatment-resistant depression. And that's when I knew this is a real thing. Like this is a powerful antidepressant treatment, at least for some people. It doesn't yeah. work for everybody and not everybody wants to do it, but. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I find so fascinating about this is it's just one of the most low hanging fruit, beautiful, just ubiquitously available examples of why there is, we don't have this mind body dualism that we think we have. Like we, we have this idea that the mind, I, I mean, and ontologically, I love having this conversation and I think consciousness is a very rich philosophical topic. However, when it comes to your subjective experience and how you feel and how you view the world and how you function, there is a huge, huge relationship between your body and your mind. Like they're, they're, they're really one in the same. And I know how I feel when I've fasted. I know how I feel when I've tried lower carb diets or cut sugar out of my diet. And there really is a huge difference in clarity, a huge difference in energy, a huge difference in energy levels. And we just don't think of food that way. We don't think of what we're putting into our bodies as what we're putting into our minds. We think of it as somehow mutually exclusive or at least somehow distinct from one another. And I think that that is just a hugely important wake up call that everybody needs to have if they haven't already that the that it's not just about your mind or your body it's about the whole picture of wellness and the whole picture of being able to function well in life and obviously your research goes much much deeper and you are able to find this relationship in extraordinarily striking ways in in being a mental health oriented physician. Um, so at what point then does this go from a personal experiment to, you know what, I think a lot of people that I'm working with could benefit from this and I'm going to have the audacity to, to try prescribing it. You know, so, so I've actually been prescribing it to patients for about 20 years now. And, um, but early on, we, you know, it was still called the Atkins diet. Mm -hmm. It was highly controversial still. I mean, it still is today. Um, but at that point in time, we didn't even have many research studies documenting its safety or effectiveness for weight loss or diabetes or anything. So I was actually just really worried. There were low carb physicians who were losing their licenses, wow. getting fired um, because they were considered dangerous quacks. And um, so I was kind of like, I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I worked. I worked hard to get to this position. I don't. I don't want to lose my license or anything. So I laid low with it all. I was just helping patients in front of me. Uh, you know, a lot of my patients, I was still using medications or psychotherapy or other conventional psychiatric treatments for their illnesses. But there were some people who were really interested in diet or who were willing to try it. Or, you know, in particular, there were just a few people that I felt like we've tried everything or, you know, one person, type 2 diabetes and obesity and chronic depression, not getting better. He had tried so many pills. He'd even had shock therapy and all wow. sorts of things. And nothing was working for him. <clears throat> so with him, I, 
kind of, you know, did more education on this diet might really help a lot of things that you've got going on and it might make a difference in your mental health too. Um, and lo and behold, it did. So, um, but everything kind of turned around for me in 2016. Um, when I had a patient with what's called schizoaffective disorder, which is a cross between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, he asked for my help to lose weight. He had been my patient for eight years, had daily hallucinations and delusions, was tortured by his illness, had tried 17 different medications. None of them worked. Wow. Um, and was in and out of hospitals. I mean, his life was ruined by this illness. He wants to lose a little bit of weight. We decided to try a ketogenic diet. And within two weeks, I'm noticing this powerful antidepressant effect in him. I'm thinking, wow, that's really interesting. He's getting it because I had no expectations. So even though I'd been using this treatment with depressed patients or anxious patients for a long time, he's got schizophrenia, basically. I, I have no expectation that that's going to do anything for schizophrenia. Yeah. Like, why yeah. the hell would it do anything for that? Um, I'm just trying to help the guy lose some weight. Uh, but he gets this powerful antidepressant effect. And I'm thinking, wow, that's that's fascinating that it's he's getting that antidepressant effect that I've seen so many times in other people who just have plain old depression. The thing that completely upended my world as a psychiatrist was about two months in when he started spontaneously reporting that his longstanding auditory hallucinations were going away and his paranoid delusions were started going away. He started to realize they weren't true and probably never had been. That particular man has now gone on to lost a, he's lost 160 pounds and has kept it off to this day, six years later. So for anybody who says this is not a sustainable diet, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, uh, maybe it's not sustainable for them, but it's sustainable for some of my schizophrenic patients. <laughs> um, uh, they can somehow figure out how to do it. Um, and, <clears throat> but much more important than weight loss, he was able to do things he hadn't been able to do since the time of his diagnosis. He was able to go out in public and not be paranoid. He completed a certificate program. He couldn't think clearly before, and he was finally able to think enough to finish a school program. He was able to move out of his father's home. He was able to get up in front of a live audience and perform improv. That's and crazy. those things, those things would have been impossible for him. And, and that is when I decided I have to do a scientific deep dive into this and figure out what in the hell is going on. What, what can this tell us yeah. about, schizophrenia yeah. and and could this possibly help more people yeah and i want to do that philosophical deep dive to you to an extent and and talk about what some of the drivers of these things are that you're finding because it seems like you're finding some pretty compelling evidence but there there's a more basic question i want to throw your way and i, I guess i would sum it up in a are we just are we poisoning ourselves? Are we like collectively as a society just mindlessly poisoning ourselves with processed food, with sugar, with carbohydrates? Because it kind of seems like that's what's going on. It kind of seems like the, the, one of the primary catalysts or primary contributors to this mental health disorder or not disorder, but crisis that we have going on throughout the world it really seems like you're showing some compelling evidence that a huge part of it is because we are essentially poisoning ourselves with processed sugary food. I actually do believe that we are poisoning the human species. It goes beyond food. Hmm. <clears throat> food is food is the obvious unequivocal culprit 
but it's not the only possibility. So at the end of the day, I want to make a couple of just overarching observations. Obesity rates are skyrocketing around the globe. Type 2 diabetes and prediabetes is skyrocketing around the globe. And mental disorders, which I consider metabolic disorders of the brain, are also skyrocketing around the globe. So anybody who says I'm being alarmist, <laughs> um, you just have to look at the statistics and ask a basic common sense question. What the hell's going on? Why would this be happening. Now, some people want to say, well, everybody's getting lazy. <laughs> um, and that's part of the stigma of yeah. mental illness. If you're mentally ill, well, then you're just lazy and undisciplined. You're hyper-reacting. You're not taking deep breaths like you should. Um, or you're just morally weak or something. There's something wrong with you because otherwise you wouldn't be mentally ill. Well, we, th we end up thinking the same things about people with metabolic disorders too. If you're overweight or obese, you're just a lazy slob. If you're diabetic, well, that's probably because you're overweight and obese. So you're a double lazy slob. If you have a heart attack at a young age, well, you triple damned. It's you're, you're, there's something wrong with you, it's laziness, or you're smoking too much, something, you're doing something wrong. It's your fault. And that is what a lot of people think by and large, is that obesity, diabetes, mental illness is the fault of the people who have them. They're just not trying hard enough. If they just tried harder, they would be fine. And so I want to put that out there because that's part of busting the stigma is we have to call it, we have to say what people are really thinking in their heads. As a physician and scientist, I don't believe that at all is a rational explanation whatsoever. Um, and I have numerous reasons that I could get into, whether they be science-based or whether they're just common sense observation things of why I'm going to challenge that. But I'm going to, I'm just going to, and I'm happy to do a dive into any of that if you want to go that direction, but I'll rest on, I don't think saying the human species has become lazy and gluttonous and weak um, just the whiny, sniveling, depressed, anxious, you know, wimps. I don't think that's the right answer. I just don't think that's the right answer. And so instead, we need to understand biology. We need to understand the biology of what overlaps with those disorders. And at the, at the end of the day, we can zero in on these tiny things in our cells called mitochondria. And I am arguing that mitochondrial dysfunction in cells can actually cause all of those epidemics that I just mentioned. It may be the primary driver of mental illness, obesity, and diabetes, and heart attacks. And when you ask this big picture question, well, what causes mitochondrial dysfunction? There are actually lots of things that can contribute to it but toxins are a big one. And, um, and when we look at our food supply, we already have clear, unequivocal evidence that some of the artificial ingredients in our food supply, such as high fructose corn syrup for one, is a mitochondrial toxin or uh, harms or disrupts mitochondrial function. Um, we, but it doesn't stop with the food supply. So the food supply has hundreds of chemicals that have already been tested by some leading scientists. And those leading scientists are just kind of like, oh my God, 
almost every one of these chemicals I test is like problematic. Like what? Like we are really screwed, folks. <laughs> like, like, yeah. like it is. This stuff is everywhere. So that's part of the challenge. But when we look at environmental toxins, such as microplastics, yeah. Which you which you can't escape nowadays. No. It's in the water. It's no no matter where you go, it's in the water. Yeah, it's in your shower curtains. It's in all of the single use plastics, and probably in like the the more resilient polycarbonate plastics to a different extent. It's in it's it's in coatings on cans. It's like that is a rabbit hole that you can go down and just kind of rightfully freak yourself out with for sure. Yes. And we have evidence that some of these environmental toxins also cause mitochondrial dysfunction. And what I'm arguing is that it's probably a combination of all of these different toxic substances, both in the food supply and in our environment. And that if you if you poison your mitochondria, it's going to disrupt how hungry you are. Hmm so that you're going to be more likely to overeat. It's also going to disrupt your basic metabolism, your basal metabolic rate, which means even if you eat the same number of calories, you're burning fewer calories, which makes it more likely that you're going to become overweight or obese. But what I'm also arguing is that at the same time that you're putting on weight, are getting heavier from all of these things, it's also affecting your brain function. And you are now more likely to suffer from depression or anxiety or OCD or even bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Wow. Yeah, so so you just did a beautiful job of answering one of the questions that I wanted to, to broach with you, which is, what are some of the main drivers of this? Since we've gotten to the bottom of, or, or at least we've discussed a lot of things that are being blamed wrongfully, what are the real drivers? And I think you just pointed out a lot of them. So of course that begs the question, what do we practically do? Because like you said, you can't really avoid microplastics. Like sure, they ban BPA, but then there's like a myriad of other ones that are probably just as bad for you that just have not been banned yet. So, and you know, like you said, it's in, it's in the water, it's in soaps, it's in shampoo. It's just in, it's, it's all over. So because we can't fully avoid these things, what are some common sense ways we can empower ourselves. What are maybe some pieces of low-hanging fruit of things that we can and should avoid? And I guess also, are there any ways that we can bolster defenses against these environmental toxins and the toxins in food? There are. So, I mean, I think I think my primary message <clears throat> kind of falls into two categories. One is there are these low-hanging things that all of us can do today to avoid some of these toxic exposures and or help our bodies heal despite being exposed to them. Um, but the other message is that at some point, someday, we are going to have to reconcile yeah. this. And yeah. we are gonna we are we are going to have to demand that the government starts looking at what impact do microplastics have on mitochondria and if we have unequivocal evidence that that's harming mitochondria maybe maybe we need to do something about all these microplastics yeah that can be as simple as better filtering the water supply maybe we start to filter out these microplastics it's i'm sure that that's possible to do it will cost more money but if these substances are harmful to human health, we should be doing that. We should be cleaning up the food supply, all of that. So back to the question that everybody probably wants to really know. Well, what can I do now? I Tell me what to do now. Well, you, you know, we're not going to hold our breath for the government to do anything or for any, all, any of these companies to do anything. So what can we do now? So the biggest thing is to, you know, I, I walk through 
many different buckets in the book and why they matter. So diet is one, substance use is another, and I'm going to include the big ones I'm going to include. Drinking, smoking, vaping, marijuana. That's four, kind of. Um, sleep. Sleep is huge. Light exposure, stress, stress reduction, and stress reduction practices like breathing or meditation or others. Um, all of these things can play a role. I'm, I'm um, guessing, unfortunately, you're not going to say that smoking, drinking, vaping, and marijuana are going to help you. They're not good for your <laughs> mitochondria. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> I'm really sorry. So they will all they will all help you relax or manage stress or something in the short run. And that's why people do them. I'm not at all here to deny that. I'm a big fan of common sense. And so, so we have to acknowledge that these substances help reduce anxious symptoms in people. That's largely why they're using them. And then if they become regular users of these substances, they get hooked on them. And now it's a double whammy because they might have baseline anxiety from the foods and everything else that we're eating. And that's why they started smoking regularly anyway or drinking regularly anyway because they were anxious or depressed or didn't feel good, something when they wanted to feel better. And lo and behold, it worked. Those substances worked. And so they keep using them. Well, now if you're hooked on them, you're going to have withdrawal symptoms when you try to cut back or go without. And that means you're going to have rebound anxiety. But we have very clear, unequivocal evidence on all of those substances that they all harm mitochondrial function. And it's a little bit of a paradox. Sometimes that's actually how they stop anxiety. Mm. So if if your brain if your brain cells are actually kind of misfiring or malfunctioning and producing anxiety symptoms when they really shouldn't. So like if you're one of those people who says, I have panic attacks for no reason, or I'm just always stressed and anxious. Even on good days, like even on good days, I just, I'm stressed and anxious and I need something to calm down. There are a few ways to restore your brain health or to stop that symptom, I should say. There, there are two primary ways to stop that symptom. One is to restore the health of those brain circuits so that they stop misfiring like that. Now, that's the strategy I'm going to argue in favor of. But the other strategy is to actually suppress the metabolism in those cells so that they can't function. Hmm. And if you suppress the metabolism enough so that they can't function, you're not going to experience anxiety. Now, you're also going... So how would you know which one is, is which? Well... When you take a substance that suppresses metabolic function, it is almost always going to cause adverse side effects that any outside person should be able to observe. You're going to look stoned or out of it. You're not going to be as attentive. You're not going to have as good of memory or cognitive function. Now, when people are using marijuana, those are all considered desirable effects. Nobody wants to be thinking. They don't want to yeah. be remembering. They don't want, they don't want to be, they're not reading books and studying for exams. Um, or they shouldn't be, because their their performance is going to be in, in impaired when they do that. And that all suggests that. It is impairing metabolism. Again, I'm not speculating. We've got clear, unequivocal science on this. Um, it is impairing metabolism. And uh, so... Can I ask, what about edible cannabis versus smoked? Because I think a lot of people listening 
are probably thinking it makes sense. Tobacco, toxic, and not just smoke tobacco. I mean, if you ingest tobacco, that is a toxic substance that can kill you. Alcohol, obviously toxic. But I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, well, wait a minute. Isn't cannabis actually anti-inflammatory because it helps with pain, because it helps with, you know, whatever? Um, and th that's a question I'm curious about, too. Is is ingesting or taking like a cannabis tincture, it, Do you can is that toxic we or 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 does it just or or um, the real and the real and function so the real answer is we we don't have clear data on all of the different substances like cbd in particular right. we don't have clear data on at all um the data that we've got is mostly on thc so thc in its pure form impairs mitochondrial function um, and mitochondria actually have, um, cannabinoid receptors. So those yes. are the receptors for marijuana. They actually have those receptors right on them. And researchers have done research actually trying to figure out because those receptors are found both on mitochondria and they're found on the outside of the cell. And it turns out that the, the THC's effects on mitochondria are the ones that are impairing memory, impairing mm. motivation, so kind of slowing people down. Again, for most people using it, they don't care. They don't care that they're slowed down. They don't care that their memory is a little bit impaired. They want to chillax, and that's what they're getting. Um, but if you're using it on a regular basis because now you're anxious or depressed or can't sleep or have chronic pain, you need to at least be aware of that. Could CBD or some of the other tinctures or some of the edibles maybe be different? Absolutely. They might be different. I don't think we really have full data on it yet. Okay. So. I'm going to probably say something will piss everyone off, <laughs> but as, as a psychiatrist, I'm going to say I would probably err on the side of avoiding those. And so until they're proven safe, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume they're safe because that's what we've, that's the mistake we've made in the food industry is we assume everything's safe until proven guilty. And that has been a disaster for the for the human species. Maybe maybe um, you could give them a nugget and totally disagree with me. If I, I'm not trying to just get you to agree with me, but maybe you could give all these people a nugget. Do you think that of those vices that you mentioned, smoking, marijuana, uh, and drinking, perhaps in responsible amounts, maybe marijuana is the least of those evils, or would you not even go that far? The dose is the poison. So if, with all of them, okay. small amounts of alcohol, probably fine. Our bodies can detoxify it. You can get some of the benefits of alcohol. Maybe you're getting some resveratrol if you're drinking red wine, or maybe you know blood alcohol lowers your blood pressure. Maybe it's doing that, and that can be a good thing. So there are some benefits to all of these substances. And if somebody is really stressed and anxious and they can't figure any other way out of it, um, you know, or if somebody's having chronic debilitating pain, or if somebody's having nausea from chemotherapy, yeah. zero doubt in my mind, that person should be using marijuana <laughs> or some tincture or some edible or something. They should be using something. Because the alternative is so much worse. It's just so much worse in terms of human suffering. And it's so much worse in terms of the adverse effects of the stress of that. If you have unrelenting pain, just the experience of having unrelenting pain is taking a huge toll on your health. So if you can't figure out any other way to manage the pain and marijuana is the way to manage it, I would be all for that person using marijuana. But I would put it with a caveat that at the end of the day, this is not a long-term lifetime strategy 
of health and longevity, that if you really want to maximize your health and longevity, we're going to have to figure out some other possible solutions, like looking at diet, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, other things. Yeah. Try to heal your body in other ways so that maybe you don't need that substance all of the time. Makes total sense. So I think the way that we wound up here to begin with is we were talking about different drivers, different low-hanging fruit things people could do to change. That makes complete sense. But I sense that there's a lot more <laughs> where that came from. There is. So the, the three biggest ones that I'm going to mention are diet, exercise, and sleep. And those are three areas that people by and large in the United States, aren't necessarily doing well. Um, so sleep is mass, it's a massive problem. A lack of sleep is a massive problem. People are staying up late, binge watching Netflix or gaming or whatever. Um, and then they and, may be exacerbating the lack of sleep with circadian disruption from blue light sources and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of it. And then they have to wake up at a certain time in the morning. So their alarm gets them up, meaning they were still asleep. If, if you are waking up to an alarm, and especially if you're really exhausted when you first wake up, it means you're not getting enough sleep, bottom line. Um, if that happens one or two or three days a week, not a big deal. But if it's happening every day of the week, like it is for most Americans, it's a big deal. And it means that you're probably sleep deprived. Um, so I would say if you are interested in improving your mental health or metabolic health, one step, one important step is try to prioritize sleep. And that usually means go to bed earlier than what you're going to bed. Um, and you, that re just requires a conscious decision and some effort to maybe avoid, you know, if screens are definitely keeping you up, maybe turn the screens off a half an hour before you want to go to bed and force yourself to read a really boring piece of paper book or something. And then you'll get so tired and bored that you'll be sleepy as hell and then you'll fall asleep. Um, yeah, it works. Try Try to avoid, try to avoid picking up the phone when you're in bed. If you do wake up in the middle of the night, if you've got insomnia, don't be getting on your phone so much. Maybe put the phone in another room yeah. or put it further away from you. Try to make your room as dark as possible. Um, you know, all of those things. So mm -hmm. trying to get more sleep, diet. The number one rule I'm going to go with is the more you can eat real whole foods, the better. Um, so try to get rid of the stuff that comes in bag, plastic bags and boxes with plastic liners and all that stuff and yeah. eat just real food, whether it's meat, fish, poultry, vegetables, um, fruits, uh, other things. A lot of people are into whole grains. I personally am not into whole grains, but if you're going to eat grains like breads and pasta and other grains, try to make them real whole grains. More often than not, even foods that are labeled whole grain are not actually whole grain. The FDA allows for this, um, because, uh, the, the definition of a whole grain is a whole intact grain, meaning that the grain was never crushed. Um, and so it, it gets absorbed much more slowly hmm. and causes a, a less rapid rise in your blood glucose levels. Yeah. We have all sorts of evidence that whole grains are good for you. Everybody's heard that. The FDA unfortunately allows goldfish, you know, like the, yeah. the cheddar cheese yeah. goldfish. To be labeled whole that. grain. That seems suspect. That seems sus. It is suspect. So basically, when they make goldfish, they're allowed to crush the grains. And then they just put the 
if they put back equal parts of the germ and the bran, then hmm. then so they're it's no longer a whole intact grain. But if they put it back enough of the parts of the grain, then they can call it a whole grain. It defeats the whole purpose of a whole grain. So yeah, it, cue it, the Futurama um, meme on that one, if you know what I'm <laughs> talking about. Um, so if someone. I guess I'm conversationally cornering you because I was going to say if somebody cornered you, it's clear that for you, you derived enormous benefit from going on a ketogenic, low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And you, again, you know, just said you're not a fan of whole grains, but they're probably better. Do you think that ideally in your heart of hearts, do you think that people should just be eating very, very few carbohydrates to be at maximal health, regardless of if they're having any of these deeper seated issues? Or do you think, no, it's totally fine. If, if you're, if you think you're okay eating this way, then by all means continue. Or do you think really maximal health peak wellness comes from eating low carbohydrate, low sugar? I'm going to give a compl complex answer to that. Um, <laughs> By all unfortunately, means. unfortunately, I wish I could give you a simple. So there are lots of people who will say yes or no to that unequivocally. Yeah. And so the reason I'm going to give you the complex answer is because I want to, I want to at least share with people my understanding of how I come to the conclusion I come to. So I want to just point out. People in China have been eating white rice for millennia. True. And for the most part, and white rice has composed a huge part of their diet, a very large percentage of the calories they consume. White rice is all carbohydrates. It, it has a minimal amount of protein or fat. Um, so it is essentially, you should just consider it pretty much all carbohydrates. And yet the Chinese have had very low rates of obesity, diabetes, and mental illness while consuming massive amounts of white rice. Since China has westernized, since they have quote unquote developed industries, fast food, processed food, rates of obesity, diabetes, and mental illness are skyrocketing throughout China. So there's something in the Western environment, and again, I'm going to say either in the food supply or the toxins that are created by industries, the toxins that are created by plastics and all of the packaging, um, or the pesticides that are getting used, something, there's something in the Western environment that is causing metabolic harm mm -hmm. that results in skyrocketing rates of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So to get back to your question, for that observation that I just shared with you makes it difficult for me to say it's carbohydrates. Because if I could go back in time to 500 years and if if you asked me, should this Chinese person be eating white rice? I would say, yeah, it seems to be doing great. They, they, they're doing great on white rice and they have very low rates of obesity and diabetes and mental illness and their health is pretty well maintained and they have a thriving culture and they're doing fine. Let them eat white rice. Why not? And that's a grain. So the complication is that when your mitochondria get poisoned, whether it's by a food or an environmental toxin. When your mitochondria get poisoned, it makes it harder for you to use carbohydrates as an mm. energy source. Okay. And that's where I think low-carbohydrate diets become better alternatives, possibly in our environment. So it's not... I mean, I can think of some other speculations. You know, there are... There are Groups of people who hate glyphosate, they think glyphosate yeah. is the 
is the toxin that accounts for everything. And glyphosate is mostly found on grains. Right, right. Um, and so grains, if you eat grains, you're getting a massive dose of glyphosate. So if you are in the camp of glyphosate as a toxin, and we have reason to believe it is, um, <laughs> then... Yeah. Uh, then maybe avoiding grains isn't really about the carbohydrates or the grains. It's really about the toxins that we're adding to the grains in our modern world. Um, but bottom line is with all the complexity, if you can eat, if you can eat a diet and you have normal blood pressure, normal weight, normal blood sugars, and good mental health, keep eating the diet you're eating. <laughs> I don't care what it is. If you're eating lots of processed foods and you have all of those healthy metrics, that's great. Keep doing it. There's a good chance you're probably not going to have all those. Like I said, over 90% of US adults don't have all of those metrics as healthy anymore. So if if you have any of those metrics that are unhealthy, you need to really seriously look at your diet and think about a change. Um, and the changes that I am that I have seen work best for people are eliminating or, or reducing carbohydrates and grains and sugars, added sugars definitely. Yeah. And and also Reducing or eliminating processed foods and going with whole, real foods. That makes total sense. So we, we've got those substances that you, that you named that are going to make a bunch of people unhappy. We got diet. We got sleep. What, was there another? Exercise. Were those three? Exercise, of course. Of course. Exercise. Yeah. You got to move. You got to move somehow, some way. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be... Yeah. Two or three days a week, if you really don't want to do it, if you don't have time to do it, if you don't exercise at all, start small. Yeah. Just do something. Just go for a walk. Just try. And and you're going to – I want you to pair it with a few other really helpful things. Pair it with leave your phone at home. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you're out walking, even if this is just 10 minutes – 10 minutes is all I'm asking of you. 10 minute walk. Try to get some sunshine on your face if you can. You're not looking at the sun, but you're going to let the sun be on your face. Get some bright light in your eyes. Um, and maybe practice deep breathing or just pay attention to your breathing while you're taking your walk. Or try to practice mindfulness while you're taking your walk. Meaning... Look at the trees, look at the buildings, look at the sidewalk, look at look at what's really in your space and just notice it and yeah. pay attention to it and try to try to not be inside your head with all your worries and thoughts and fears and everything. Try to let go of those and just notice, oh, look at that tree over there. That's interesting. I've never really taken the time to look at the tree, but it's really, it's a cool tree or or it's a messed up tree. Like why haven't they cut that messed up tree down? Um, does, doesn't matter what kind of a tree it is, Yeah. but just notice the tree. Notice the clouds in the sky. Notice the smells. Notice something. Um, and then you're doing like two or three different things all at once. Yeah. I, I recall reading a positive psychology oriented study, and I believe it was a meta analysis of the impact on physical activity on, as it relates to like positive affect and general health. And I remember reading something almost unbelievable, something to the effect of getting a total of 30 minutes a day, I want to say it was only like three or four days a week of moderate physical activity. And this included walking, not even walking for 30 minutes consecutively, by the way. So it could be like three 10 minute walks, like reduced. I, th I think it might have been all cause mortality. It was definitely cardiovascular related death and increased positive affect by some ridiculous amount. 
So like, just to your point of like, you know, people might be hearing this stuff thinking like, oh yeah, diet exercise. It's like, first of all, you can't shrug it off if you're not doing it and pretend like you already know this if you're not really doing it. But two, just the, the that just demonstrates the power of what you're talking about, that it's it's very real. And it's it's not just, oh, I'm, I'm going to feel better going for a walk. It's like, well, give it a try. Give it, give it, give it a try because it is, it is a pretty powerful thing when you, when you do it regularly and it becomes a regular part of your routine. The biggest thing I want to say to the skeptics is that you're right. So many people are skeptical. That's not going to work for me. That's not powerful enough for me. The, the biggest thing I want to tell people is this, it is the combination of all of those things that I just said. So we're yeah. going to look at the combination of diet, movement or exercise, sleep, and substance use or managing your substance use. You've got to do all four of them in order to get the aha miraculous improvement in your life. And you don't have to do all of them at once. But, you, but I don't want you to judge whether it's effective or not until you're doing all four of them. And I can tell you this, if you are addicted to processed foods and sugar, it is going to suck changing your diet. You are going to be miserable. You're going <laughs> to hate it. You're going to be craving that food. You're going to be thinking, this is not improving my mental health. It's making it worse. If you are a daily drinker and you have you know, four drinks, four beers every day, and I'm asking you to reduce that or even eliminate that. That is going to suck trying to get off yeah. all that alcohol. It is not going to be pleasant. Your anxiety is going to get worse. You're going to have cravings. You're going to think, I don't want to live the rest of my life like this. This is, I'm miserable. This sucks. This is awful. Who wants to, what's the point in living if I can't have a drink? Um, that's what's going to go through your mind. But what I'm telling you is that if you are in a position where you're thinking, my life sucks, you're already drinking and eating all your processed foods and not sleeping and not exercising. So you've, you've got everything you want. And yeah. you're saying, my life still sucks. I'm depressed. I'm miserable. I'm lost. I don't know what's wrong with me. What I'm telling you is that those things can make a massive difference. I have been there and done it. I am telling you firsthand experience. I can speak on behalf of the hundreds of people I have talked to who have changed their lives with this. You won't believe how good of a life you are capable of having until you make all the changes but, you, but it's going to take some time. You, you got to give yourself like six months or something, or even a year of, I got to work toward this. I yeah. can't do all this at once. I can't change my diet and give up my alcohol and start sleeping. And I can't do all that at the same time. So you're going to do one at a time, slowly but surely, but you're going to have your, you're going to have your eye on the end, on the finish line. And the finish line is not, I'm going to do this 10 minute walk three days this week. And if I don't feel better, I'm not walking anymore. That's not the way the treat. That's not, right. that's not the way it's going to work. Cause if you walk 10 minutes for three days, it's guess what? It's not going to change your life at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Not on its own, but, but I find that when you are able to apply your will toward a behavior change like that, that in and of itself becomes very rewarding. And uh, I, I would guess that maybe my neuroscience is wrong here, but I would guess that that begins to drive dopamine in its own way because you start to get addicted to the feeling of being able to apply your will to overcome things that are challenging. And that in and of itself gives you a, like some kind of feel good, you know, um, I guess just to something 
something that feels like you're doing something that you're earning and that it's making a difference. Like a, a very simple, um, low hanging fruit example in my own life is I've been a lifelong coffee drinker, drink it every morning, you know, creeps into the afternoon sometimes. So I decided, okay, I'm like, I'm doing stuff on my own time now. So if I don't take a break from coffee, I'm never going to take a break from, break from coffee. So I cut coffee out for a couple of weeks. And to your point, it sucked. It was like the first few days were terrible. Um, But then after that, like you sort of feel like you're doing this, even if it's just important to you, you feel like you're doing this important thing and you're applying your will in a way that actually makes a difference. Um, But so I'd love to hear your riff on that. But the other thing I wanted to ask too, and maybe we can, these can be some of the, the final points of riffing are other enhancements adjuncts, interventions that you think have potential. Like I'm a big believer in cold exposure. I was, I I did a lot of regular cold exposure for a long time and I still do cold showers pretty regularly. And obviously there's a lot of emerging science on that as it relates to mitochondrial function and cellular health and several other things. But um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with that. I served you up a few different balls there. Yeah. So, so in terms of accomplishing something that you set your mind to, there is zero doubt that that, that there is probably, there are probably few things in life that are more powerful than that. Yeah. Because otherwise you're going through life feeling like a helpless victim. Right. That, that life is just happening to you that your boss tells you what to do and you have no control over it and you can't fight back or you can't push back and you just have to do what you're told. Your parents tell you, your wife or husband tells you, or people are telling you what to do and you just have to do it and you have no agency whatsoever in your life. That is unequivocally the most miserable way to go through life. You're essentially a slave. You're a slave to other people. Yeah. Um, And so as soon as you start to take action and take, make a decision, and especially when it's a decision to do something hard, that's going to be challenging, that is going to suck for the first week or so. If you can actually get yourself to do it, you're becoming powerful. Right. I mean, that's what it is in a nutshell. You're becoming powerful. You're becoming somebody who can make up his or her mind and say, this is what I want to do. I'm going to do it. And I'm actually going to follow through. I'm going to make it happen. And, and then if your boss is treating you like shit at work, guess what? You're going to go out and find a new job or you're going to push back on your boss and you're going to say, I I don't deserve to be treated this way. Uh, let's come up with a better way for us to work together. And if your boss, you know, if your boss gives in, then you're going to be like, hey, I just, I just got like a much better working environment just by asserting myself yeah. and standing up for myself. And if your boss refuses, you'll figure out a new way to get a better job or a different job. And you're empowered. And, and, and that's everything. That's it like is. not yeah. being miserable Absolutely. five days a week, eight hours a day or whatever your work schedule is. Instead of being a slave, essentially, you are now an empowered, assertive, active human being who can figure out what you need, what you want, and you get it and you make yeah. it happen. Um, what was the second thing you... Uh, Pitched it, me uh, enhancements or adjusts yes. or things like, f- for me, like cold exposure, supplementation. Cold ex- um, what are your cold thoughts? Cold exposure, yeah. 100%. Cold exposure, zero doubt. You know, some people talk about the dopamine release that you get from cold exposure. My big thing that completely lines up with my theory is cold exposure basically forces your body to produce more heat. That's Mm -hmm. what it's doing. Heat is made by mitochondria in our bodies, in our cells. 
that is where heat is made. Whether it's the mitochondria in your muscles and when you shiver, whether it's the mitochondria in your brown fat, which can also be a source of heat. heat it's always made in mitochondria because they're burning calories. And instead of turning those calories into energy, they're turning those calories into heat. And so when you expose yourself to cold water, cold baths, cold ocean, cold shower, even just if you live yeah. in a cold environment, just go outside with a light jacket on or no jacket on or whatever and allow yourself to get cold. Don't allow frostbite. You know, so you know, I got to put in the warning, like don't go get frostbite guys, yeah. but, uh, but allow yourself to feel the experience of cold. Usually that means you're going to shiver um, or you're, you're, you're going to be shivering. And when you do that, your body will actually make more mitochondria. That is the adaptation. Ultimately, that is the adaptation is your body will make more mitochondria. I am arguing that that is one of the ways to improve your overall health. So all the th strategies that we've talked about, reducing substance use, improves mitochondrial function, improves mitochondrial number, exercise does, a good diet does, good sleep does. So um, in terms of supplements, I'm going to be honest. So there are a few hot supplements on the market that a lot of people are getting excited about. NA, like yeah. NAD precursors. Yeah, yeah. NMN so that, and NAD plus. And yeah, yeah, I'm familiar yeah. with those. Yep. And um, nicotinamide riboside NR. Mm -hmm. So you can buy those as supplements. A lot of people love them. A lot of people are talking about them. There's another one, urolithin A, that hmm. improves mitochondrial function. Um, the big caution I'm going to just put out there with supplements is su they're nothing new. Supplements have been around for decades, longer really, but for many decades, people who've been, researchers who've been focused on mitochondrial health have been recommending antioxidant supplements, for instance, like yeah, vitamin yeah. C, vitamin E, um, the B vitamin, some of those. At the end of the day, the evidence suggests they actually probably don't work. And here's the shocking thing. Sometimes they hurt. Sometimes they cause harm because they're a little bit of inflammation yeah. is actually good for you. And some of the antioxidants, if you're taking it as a massive supplement, are completely suppressing the inflammatory response or at least suppressing it too much so that it actually ends up being bad for you. We have evidence of that with vitamin E. We have yeah. like too much vitamin E is really bad for you um, and increases mortality. Uh, I just saw a paper not too long ago, vitamin C of all things, vitamin C is supposed to be good for you. It actually prevents your muscles from making more mitochondria, which is a really bad hmm. thing. Hmm. Um, and again, I think it goes along with you don't want to suppress inflammation too much. Yeah, because you get this so-called hormetic response, right? Like you yes, you want exactly. to actually have a certain amount. So this is, you know, simple, simple example, going to the gym. What are you doing when you're lifting a heavy weight to an extent? Well, you're for sure stressing the muscle. You're to an extent even damaging the muscle, but you need to do that to maintain or gain muscle mass. Yes, exactly. And part of the response, so when you stress and tear that muscle, the response to allow that muscle to grow more is actually inflammation. Right. That muscle becomes inflamed because inflammation is bringing more amino acids and glucose to that muscle cell so that it will grow more. And that's part of what inflammation is doing. We have a lot of evidence that like athletes, if they use ibuprofen after an extensive workout, like if they do an intensive workout and then take ibuprofen, ibuprofen is inhibiting inflammation. And that turns out to be bad for athletes because it prevents the muscle gains that they're trying to get. Um, you don't want to suppress 
inflammation all the way when it's healthy inflammation. The other side of the equation, though, if you injure yourself or if you have arthritis in your knee and your knee is swollen up and hurting, yes, take ibuprofen. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Take ibuprofen. It'll help your poor knee. But understand that if you're also working out like upper body or something, when you're taking massive doses of ibuprofen, you're actually not going to get very many gains as you're doing your upper body workout um, because you're taking so much ibuprofen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, we've been going for about two hours already. And I still, I honestly feel like we're barely scratching the surface of this, but I want to be respectful for your time of your time rather. And I think we have covered a lot of ground, but man, I really could just continue picking your brain for at least another hour (laughs) <laughs> but I will, but, but let's, let's wrap this one up. I would love to talk to you again sometime, anytime you're working on anything, want to promote anything. Uh, there's so much more fertile ground to explore. So I'd love to have you back, but congrats on the book. Congrats on everything you have going on. I, I find all this to be so compelling and so much of it to be almost like just no brainer stuff. When you really read it, it's like, oh man, he, he definitely has it nailed. And I also got, I got to be honest, I always love somebody who's got a little bit of like a rebellious, defiant <laughs> streak. And I feel like that's part of part of where you're coming from with a lot of this stuff. So I love that as well. I love that as well. It is. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it's been, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's been a great conversation. And I yeah. agree. There's so much more we could talk about.